Hey y'all. Hey, hey. Hey everybody. Um, I'm Trace Nelson. Back at it again um, at my hopefully regularly scheduled Friday 1 p.m. time slot here on Black Food Folks. Um, these conversations are really the sort of my wish list conversations. Folks that I love, admire, um, am inspired by. Um, and this week I am honored to talk to somebody I have known for over 13 years, Christopher Stewart. Um, she is a brilliant chef. Um, she understands the landscape of the food space amazingly, um, and she has a new project called The Mies Group, which you all going to find out so much about, but, um, yeah, let me see if I can find Christopher. Hey. It's going to be a good one, y'all. Gorgeous girl. Hey. How are you? I'm amazing. How are you? I'm doing really well. So glad to do this. I've been wanting to have you on for a while. And it's, yeah. I feel like we are in the periphery all the time, but don't get a chance to really chat very often. So I this know. is going to be good. Catch up. I know. Good. I'm okay. So, yeah. You. Really mm. reached out. Awesome. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, which I'm unsure if you'd be able to be unfamiliar, this is the very brilliant Christopher Stewart. Um, you know her here on Instagram and most socials as Eating Fabulously. Um, her blog has been, I want you, I want to remember how long it's been around, um, has been in existence really at the beginning of when blogging was, in the food space at least, was becoming pretty prolific and people were using platforms that were sort of subverted um, traditional media to really tell diverse and interesting stories that weren't beholden to anything and um, just sort of following her journey on that platform has been interesting but she's parlayed that into so many other amazing things so if you when you get off of here make sure you go over and follow even fabulous immediately and the Mies group <laughs> but um, I feel like with everyone right you start with their origin right because I think um, I think uh, you could easily start with your, your time at CIA and thinking about when, how you came to food, but your, your your entrenchment in food really started, I mean, with your family. So if you could just yeah. like, talk about why food became your thing. So I was like, food is ingrained in my family. Um, my grandfather was a chef. Um, so he started us really, really early in food, dining, restaurants, and hotels. So he was a hotel chef, and he worked at, like, some of the best. Marriott, the Waldorf Astoria, um, the, uh, uh, um, like, just major hotels. So, and we were lucky enough to, like, to live and eat where he worked. So I got a chance to see that very early on and plus in my home as well. Like he would always have me in the kitchen with him, allowing me to put my hands and stuff. Um, like Chris, taste this. How do you feel about this? We would go out to eat where he worked in the hotels and I would just be like trying to eat my food. And he's like, Chris, how do you, how do you feel about this flavor? And I'm like eight, nine, and I'm like, Grandpa, I like just, I just like, but he was just really, you know, enriching that in me. And then my family, like, we all are great cooks. We all have, you know, fun with food. We all eat out constantly as well. So it's really just family start. And then as I grew up, I was always like curious about what people ate. So my friends I'm like hey can I have some of that and then I'm just always like want to taste new things new restaurants you know like I was that kid who would like stay home from school to watch Julia Childs and Chef Jacques Pepin and write the notes I, I think I still have some of those notes that I would like play the key and write <laughs> you know yeah. I watched I watched the Culinary Institute on Amer uh, of uh, America on TV I would take notes yep, on that yeah. It was always just like 
can I eat some of that? <laughs> well, because also you, I mean, you grew up in New York, so this sort of like embarrassment of riches in terms of influences, right? Because I think sometimes we think about, we it's sort of trite when we talk about the melting pot, no, like narrative, but like in your schools and neighborhoods you would have been growing up in, as well as from your grandfather's influences, you would have been tasting the world really in an intentional way from birth. But also you, you benefit from being part of a generation that had such a particular kind of food in the zeitgeist in a really important way. So you talk about TV being important, but like that PBS factor, that sort of early Food Network factor is real, right? Like it gave us this kind of way of seeing food as possible professionally. Yeah, I, know, I know that we joke about like Food Network, but Food Network changed the game. Like, let's not get it twisted. Yeah. Like, Food Network is the reason why we're here or we could be here. So mm -hmm. it was the Food Networks. It was the at the shows on PBS, it was growing up in the Bronx and Manhattan, having friends of different cultures um, to just taste everything I could, watch it all, take notes on it, try it. My family really let me try food at home. So like I would cook, like I would take food that we had, like just leftovers and I would play with it and plate it, to, um, so many different ways and they would just let me do it i mean like i'm that kid that had the little tykes cook set and i'm calling my family like i made dinner for us mind you it's wet paper towels but in my mind it was i made this meal for us please come to my restaurant eat my food and they're like oh this is so good <laughs> like, yeah okay yeah. <laughs> but like empowering you to sort of see yourself as like that that artist right yeah. So let's talk about CIA because it's like well, I feel like I want to like I have a thing a project working and I'm gonna have to circle back with you about your granddad. Um, mm -hmm. but I feel like CIA makes so much more sense now. Like I I forget sometimes that you are a kid of New York. Like I grew up in in Newark, so like this sort of sense of being close to home and what sort of schools you choose. Also, I mean y'all CIA talks a lot about y'all talk a big game about being the the hardest acquaintances, but that, that that's a really particular choice. I think it sort of informs a lot about sort of how you um, show up in the industry. So talk a little bit about CIA and that experience, because there's, um, there's some really interesting factors around CIA that I think you could, you know. Yeah. So I knew when I saw CIA on TV, I knew that's where I wanted to go. And I told my yeah. parents and my family, I was like, that's where I want to go. Nowhere else. We go in there, you know, because watching it from my view at the time and like knowing that I wanted to be a chef really really young it was just like this is the mecca of culinary and like all mm. things food and I knew when it was time to apply for college that was it and you know like it is the Harvard of culinary school you know you go up there and the campus is everything is food from the places you live on campus are named after food related things. The roads are named after food related things. And it's really, I joke all the time that CIA is like the army of culinary school. You know, you're up to go to class at 3 a.m. You're up to go to class at 6 a.m. You're up going to class at 1 a.m. You take fish class for a week and your roommates could smell you coming down the hall because yeah. you're so, it's so intricate in learning. It's detail, it's stamina, you know, like, I don't know if it's the same now, but, but when we got there, it was like, the average kid doesn't make it past the lecture classes because they're so intensive. So while you're in it, you're like, I can't wait to get out. But then when you get out and you take a step back and you look around, you're like I'm so glad I made this choice. It's yeah. I highly recommend it to everyone if they can. So we talk a lot about like sort of the I'm I started with CIA or asked the question myself because I think that we have these conversations sometimes around the value of culinary school and like I went to Johnson Wells and like I use every part of my degree um in my work. There's the notion around I remember really clearly them talking a lot about the cohort of your classmates being really important to 
um, who are gonna be your peers in your like in your professional life. Mm -hmm. And it's really held up. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, like even though you lose contact with folks, um, the folks who were in your your kind of class and you're in the in your ether really do become um collaborators, peers, um, going forward. I know for you, um, a lot of folks that you were in community with, especially the um black students, you I mean have stayed in contact with, I mean, from JJ to a bunch of other people. Now I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what the what Black Life once the CIA was like and what um sort of moving past school into like your professional life has looked like in terms of keeping contact with those folks um life at cia was very it was interesting because there were not a lot of black kids on campus i mean mm -hmm. i just gotta come out and say it like there wasn't a lot of us on campus at the time when i was there it's a majorly pre predominantly white um private school so that was a culture shock to me because i'm a city kid like i have everything at my disposal and then i go on campus and it's only like four percent of us are black so that was interesting um i had to learn how to make friends who were white like let's just be honest mm -hmm. like a lot of my close friends to this day i was their first black friend so that really yeah changed how I started to look at things I love them like we still talk now we've all progressed we're all now executive chefs and we're business owners like and we do all these things so CIA really opened me up to a broader um scope of friends which I'm grateful for and then like yeah. after that you know you look up after graduation and you like peek over somewhere and you're like hey like you were in my class right and you start to build that and you talk to that line cook and that line cook is like yeah remember you know so and so from pastry yeah they work over across the street at xyz so you do always keep someone in your circle and that mm -hmm. circle grows and grows and grows as you get higher up in your field your career so talk to me about what you what your expectation was when you left school. What did you think? What did, what did what did what was like your five ten year outlook then? Like what did you think you would be doing? So <laughs> I my goal like I had very specific goals for myself. So I knew that I wanted to be a chef. I knew I wanted to be sous chef by twenty five. I knew I wanted to be executive chef by thirty. And leaving school, I knew that was what I had to do and what I wanted to do. So I had all of this like culinary school knowledge, but I had very specific goals for myself. I also knew who I didn't want to work for, right? So at that time, it was like chefs yelling at you, cursing at you, throwing plates at you. No, 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 we're not doing none of that, right? So that forced me to really like pay attention and narrow down who I would work for. I also mm. knew that I wanted to cook food that, you know, like I respect all types of food, but it's just like, I knew on myself, the pudding with the tweezers and like all that ten, all that small dynamic, I knew that wasn't for me either. So I took that, mm. and put that there and I focused on, okay, this is an extremely hard industry. I also knew that I didn't want to be broken and stripped of my femininity in this extremely hard male dominated industry, right? Mm -hmm. So I, all those things that I knew I wanted to do and just laser focus on trying to carve that out for myself. And that landed me in some really <laughs> weird situations. Like, I worked at this cafe in Harlem. I had two induction burners, three, I'm lying. I had three induction burners, I had a microwave, and I had a toaster oven. <laughs> and my friends and my parents were like, we just paid for you to go to the world's best culinary school and you're cooking on an induction burner. And I'm like, yes, because I love it. And I'm making great food in this space 
and I'm working and I'm getting up and going here every day and I love it and I look up and my wait for brunch is two hours you know like me and my team are flipping pancakes on a this tiny induction burner but we're mm-hmm. cranking up and my wait for brunch is two hours so that made me know that I didn't have to work in these prestigious places that I love don't get me wrong but you can carve out mm-hmm. your own space and still find success and then that led me to working for some celebrity shops too like I knew I didn't want to work for these yelling scream so I landed at working with Bobby Flay and Marcus Samson and all these chefs who like celebrity but they're not out here yelling and screaming and cursing at you and then I got the call and my friend was like hey come work with me this is low-key spot you know and I'm like sure and I get there and it's Swiss and I'm like learning how to make fondue I'm learning how to make roasty and then my friend leaves and he's like hey they're gonna ask you to be executive chef and I think you should take it and I'm like no I can't like I'm just here making roasty like and fondue and then executive chef happened so I always knew what I didn't want and I always knew what I wanted and I was like super laser focused on what I wanted and if that meant I worked in two restaurants a day then that's what I did that's what I did well that's that that that's that hustle right that's that sort of seeing your grandfather work all that time and sort of the I think there's a, I don't know if you, if you feel this way, because it feels sometimes like, and folks outside the world don't necessarily get it very often, but like there's a kind of click that happens, right? When that, that like, the work ethic part clicks in, in a way that like you are able to, I mean, I, I've had times where like your, your body is physically, like you don't think you're going to be able to get, but like you literally click, something clicks and you get into your whites, you get into those, you, the shoes change your posture and you sort of yeah. able to, I don't know, work in a different way. And so I love that, the idea of like the focus part is going to allow you to work in ways that serve your mission. And that's why I think, like, I tell people, if you can go to culinary school, go. Because culinary school will set you up to let you know if you can really do this. Mm. Like, in the average person probably won't go spend their free time and work in a restaurant for free. So if, like, I always encourage people, like, just go to culinary school because that right there is going to teach you if you even have the stamina, you can watch yourself get cut and keep working. If you can watch yourself, if, like, if you can get burned and keep working, if you can have somebody who's not your parents yell at you in your face, like, these Mm -hmm. are things that let you know if you can do this or not. So that's the So, I mean... no 100 percent. that's like it's like a level set right it's sort of if you're serious about like any any career right if you're serious about it yeah. i think the, the current school is the framework but like if you right the the point of it is like set the tone for understanding what this work is really going to take because yeah. you're going to get surprised and like in the midst of it if you don't level set in the beginning you, like you are going to figure out real fast if this is what you want to do Right. you are to be mad that it happened <laughs> faster than you thought it yeah. was going to be. So there's been times I was like, do I really want to do this? But then I get up the next day and I'm like, absolutely. I just had a bad day yep. yesterday, absolutely. So from from your own words, right? You you sort of had these goals when you were leaving school and you know, by mm-hmm. twenty five you made E C and like it's this sort of thing of when you, I, I had, I had it when I turned thirty. It was this thing about, I had all of these very particular goals, like this sort of metric of success that put me at thirty, and I really hadn't, and I didn't make new goals. And so, what do you do when you meet the goals you set for yourself? How did you sort of think about what was next? So I didn't expect to reach my goals earlier than I had planned them out to be. So when I did become executive chef, 
at 24 and then two weeks later I turned 25 I was like what do I do after this because I didn't think I would get that far that fast and I didn't plan after that so I took it a little hard because I'm like I've always wanted to do this I eat sleep breathe this I reached all these goals and now what so I had to sit with myself and be like, okay, what do you love to do? What's going to get you up out of the bed every day? 30 is like a great time period to figure out if you want to keep going in this direction or try something new. So I just had to narrow down what I didn't like and what I loved again. <laughs> and it led me right back to being in the restaurant just not cooking professionally anymore. Um, I did take it hard when I decided to stop cooking professionally. Because mm. again, I'm like, this is all I wanted to do. And I was like beating myself up over it. But once I got over it, I was like, okay, I still want to do this every day, just differently. So I had to carve that niche out for myself again. And so talk to me about blogging, because I feel like there's this I think a, a lot of times I'm, I really would love it if my chefs wrote or thought about writing because mm -hmm. there seems to be th just something really particular about the way we express ourselves and sort of the, the medium that you use. And I think that um, people who are called to the culinary space are naturally artistic in other ways. And so there's something really interesting about the way you think about because, I mean, again, you love restaurants. You love this industry so much. And so much about Eating Fabulously has really just been about the joyful parts of our industry and sort of helping people to navigate that and sort of highlighting the things that people may miss. And so your perspective sort of lends itself so beautifully to, to doing that work. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how writing kind of came into your, to your world or sort of the sort of media aspect of it. Um, the media translation um, of the work came to you because I feel like there's something in that sort of pivot moment that I'm sure um, helped to serve to sort of be cathartic in that way. Definitely. I mean, I'm a creative person. I've always have been. So, um, and I owe a lot of that. So again, my family, my grandmother is great at writing Um so her and I, like, she's helped me so much in my writing aspect of things. But the blogging aspect came in when I was, like you said, right at the cusp of when blogging was going somewhere. I was looking at all these blogs about food, but none of the people writing them worked in food. So I'm like, Say that part. I'm yeah. like, okay, so what are y'all talking about if you don't work in food every day? And then I looked and I saw that there were no blogs written by Black women who were also in the restaurant industry. So I'm like, well, people ask me where I eat every day. I actually mm -hmm. work in the kitchen every day. I know this stuff. Let me start my blog. And it was really when the guys from the in Patuation's blog started taking off and I was mm -hmm. like I have to do this because this is a music lawyer and this is a professional and our blog is like killing it out here I have to do this so I just started telling my story from my point of view and yeah. it's just like I want to tell you how to make restaurant quality food for a smaller home base or like yeah. I want to tell you what's in season I want to tell you how to grocery shop the way chefs do you know so the writing definitely intertwines and then and another way it's like a 360 is because when I decided to stop cooking professionally I knew I wanted to stay in the restaurant side but I didn't know what I could do so I started interning for restaurants and they're like hey you, you have a blog you want to write on our website blog so that led me to that as well which I saw a whole nother side of like how that runs how restaurant websites run how chefs run their blogs 
all of this stuff. So the creativity yeah. that we have, you can do a lot of things and still tie it in together. So I would love it if we could sort of pivot because I want to leave room for people to have questions because I'm sure that they are, you know, clamoring to ask many, many things. But um, the music group is such a specific idea and it really, I think, is such a, a smart, interesting idea. And I don't know a lot of people who think about management in the way you do and sort of use, I mean, we have folks who are, who frame their work as PR specifically or PR and marketing. We have folks who think about um, sort of artist management or sort of creative management, but there's something really particular about the way you bring your sort of all of the tools at your disposal in terms of your your background, your, your professional life, your education, and sort of your sort of ability to see the landscape really clearly um, to to this sort of management philosophy. And I would love if you could talk a little bit about the sort of origin, of, like of the idea, and then sort of formulating this this organization because it's, it's so smart but it's I, I really I think that we don't realize how much we need services yeah. like yours and like how much of an issue kind of created mm -hmm. so the Mies group is my new budding chef and restaurant management company and I developed like I was subconsciously developing this in my career transition and I didn't even know it. So again, when I stopped cooking professionally at that time, I wasn't seeing anything else that I wanted to do. Like I didn't want to be a manager. I didn't want to be like front of the house. I didn't want to be a psalm, but I knew I still wanted to be in it every day. So I'm like, okay, I can be a reservationist, you know, I can, do that and see if I like it. And I'm still in the restaurant. I still get that feel of being on the floor. I still get the feel of the vibe of the restaurant. But in mm. that, reservationist jobs don't really have a lot of things to do outside of reservationists. So nine times out of 10, they're gonna ask you like, hey, could you do this work in the office? Could you help managers get ready for service? So like, I started getting asked to do other things which led me to start paying attention to how restaurants run outside of cooking. So that's when I realized that reservations is a art in itself. It's a science in itself, right? Reservations is like, I could talk about reservations for days because it is so detailed. Reservations will either make or break you. So I learned that. And then I learned that chefs, are incredibly busy and they have no one to help them do other things outside of cooking. So I would be at work and my chef would be like, hey, Christopher, I need to ship some food across the country in three days. Could you help me with that? And I'm like, sure, let's do it. So then mm -hmm. I learned that chefs literally, like if their head wasn't attached to them, they would, they would lose it, right? So. And then on the management side, managers are like, hey, Christopher, could you print these menus? And I'm like, sure. Could you update the website? Sure. And in that, I learned that it's a disconnect because we're so busy in the restaurant just trying to make it through the day. We can't do anything else. So I really started to like put those pieces together. And subconsciously, I was building the four components of which is now the Mies Group. So that's restaurant man. I mean, that's reservations management, that's chef's management, that's menu writing, and then that is cohesive brand integration. So again, you could have an amazing restaurant, but if the menu on the table doesn't match the menu on the website, and the customer gets to the restaurant because they want what they saw on their website and they don't have it on the page, the printed menu, that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. If you call a restaurant and the, reservation does, and the reservationist doesn't know the cross street to the restaurant, you know, like, I like to call it the four waves of restaurants. So the first mm -hmm. wave is when your customer thinks that they want to come to you, right? So that's what they see. They either see your website or they see your Instagram now. So 
if your website is not working, if your the train station is not posted on your website correctly, you're already losing, right? And then the second line is when they call. So your reservationist needs to be the brightest star in the room. You know, like your reservationist mm -hmm. needs to know the cross street. They need to know the closest train station. They need to know if I can't get this customer in here, where can I send them without blurring lines that they'll still have the time of their life there? Or if I can get them in here, how do I get them in here in a way that doesn't make them feel like we kind of want you here, but we don't? So the restaurant is already making you feel some kind of way before you even sit down and eat your food. And the third is the food. That's normal. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth is how that customer feels two days after they leave you. That's that Yelp review. That's that telling five people that they loved your restaurant and those five people mm -hmm. tell five more, you know? So I figured out all that. <laughs> and put it into a company. I love it. Um, so I want to, because I want to, this. I have another question about mm -hmm. the framework, but I wonder if you are thinking at all about, because we have, I think sometimes these conversations around the state of the industry, like the dismantling or sort of reframing the industry, um, they get very esoteric very quickly and they get very, these very, we get these really circular conversations that aren't particularly useful. And there's something really interesting about someone who, because I'm the first person, like I'm a caterer, right? Like I, I'm a private chef and caterer. Mm -hmm. I've never been interested personally in making my work fit into the framework of restaurants. But mm -hmm. restaurants are, they are here to stay, right? The, the, they may shift and change and evolve, um, but restaurant culture, the restaurant space is is goal in the right? And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your insight around restaurant culture past COVID, like what, just, just this sort of sense of what sort of needs to shift or change in terms of the way we think about run restaurants? Um, maybe think about specificity, because I think about also the levels or sort of where the marketplace falls. I think we don't really get specific enough about that because there, <laughs> there are levels to this, right? And so the kinds of clients that you're dealing with and working with, the kinds of um, services services you're providing, I'm sure are applicable across the spectrum, but you really are talking about folks who have a similar philosophy in terms of the function of restaurants as you do. And so I wonder if you just talk a little bit about what that looks like in moments like this and sort of what you hope and what you see this like guys shift into. So to go back to what you said, like catering is e equally and independent chefs are equally as important as restaurants because we need both. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of caterers and independent chefs think they're like not included in that conversation, but you really are because how you flow and manage your front and back of the house is equally as important as a how a restaurant yeah. manages their front and back. Which is why I have the chef management because, again, chefs are busy, caterers are busy. They just don't have time. But um, COVID has really shown the restaurant industry's ass, so to say. Um, and I think about it every day. It's a never it's a never ending thought in my mind, like how is this going to get better or how are we gonna get out of this as a restaurant world? Like we eat 24 seven, right? So how is this gonna, like I've even had to go back to just the basics of hospitality to try to figure out getting over this hump because you know, when you go out to eat, it's very personal. Like, you're engaging with the customer. You're laughing. You're joking. You're making them feel welcome. And now 
you have to like pull down your mask to hear what they're saying right yeah. so i mean i think covid's probably the best thing that happened to restaurants because i think covid's probably the best thing that happened to restaurants and independent chefs and caterers and people in this food space because we were so stern and not adapting to anything right we're like okay i run a 150 seat restaurant i know i could do 200 on a friday i know i could do 200 for brunch i make my numbers and that's it right now you all these creative ideas are coming up from people mm. who couldn't create anymore so now you have yeah. like grocery pickup at the restaurant and now you have you know like family boxes and now caterers are putting out like these really great charcuterie board boxes that they probably would have never did before COVID. So I think COVID will change the way we eat and dine, which I'm really happy to see. It's going to reteach, it's going to reteach us how to eat and dine again. And mm -hmm. it's hard. I'm still trying to figure it out. I mean, one of my clients was like, I need you to help me reopen my restaurant in covid <laughs> and i'm like mm. <laughs> what does that look like and every day we didn't know what that was going to look like but every day you just kind of like figure out okay so after this mask for six hours a day all right that's fine but in this mask i'm going to provide a little bit extra hospitality because you can't face because i can't get close to you so i was like okay we need to up the hospitality times 10 but mm. There's no structure in COVID, so you have to create your own structure mm. and be flexible and yeah. hope it doesn't, hope it works, hope it doesn't work so you can try and do something else. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the music group because I feel like there's, like you have a, a wide range of services, but you also have a wide range of clients. And I would love it if you could talk a little bit about sort of what like, I think it was the wrong word, but like, you know, who's who is the what's the common denominator between um a music group client? They don't have enough hands in the day and they are dope. They just don't have enough hands and yeah. I'm that extra hand in helping them be even better. You know, being in the restaurant industry, you're hanging on by a thread every single day. Like, yeah. no matter what you, level you are right like it's, it's, no matter what yeah. like, whether the coffee shop on the corner to the super five star restaurant they're hanging on by a thread every single day the staff the managers are in that office crying because they're like this is hard right so and i've i have been there myself so the common denominator is you don't have enough hands to help you be doper than you already are. So let me help mm. you already are. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love it. So, cause I don't know, there's something really particular about, um, when you sort of realize you are at the threshold where like you really do need to up your game or get extra help. Um, and I, the thing I love so much about, what you're doing is like it's sort of it makes it feel more accessible because I think sometimes we you talk a lot about the tools you get in culinary school but like you're, to your point right there are some things that you just you don't really know you don't know until you realize it like yeah like I need you know I just need those that extra set of eyes that extra set of um set that that set of expertise is going to help me to sort of mm -hmm. think about that in the next level of my work and so I don't know. I just there's something beautiful about that because it's it's not um no it just doesn't feel like I feel like we feel like we're alone a lot, right? You feel like you have to figure out everything on your own to figure out you know the if the price of PR is crazy, like just all these services that feel like piecemeal sort of a la carte, right? You have it's like you can create this kind of one stop um, where you're gonna help make you yeah, I love the the make you doper than you are like it's so cool yeah and I've also let my clients personalize what they need too so from mm. the services that I offer 
you as an independent chef may need a little chef management and then you may need a little cohesive brand integration, you know, like, so I do like the personalized aspect of that. Each of my clients that I have worked with, they've either started with one service and they have come back and been like, wait, I don't need that now. I'm growing. I need this now. Or, um, I've had one client who's like, I need everything, <laughs> you know, like I've had mm -hmm. two clients who were like, I just need your eyes for something real quick because I think it's good, but I know you can make it look better. So the personalization aspect of it, I really like because again, you're already dope. Let's just get doper. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you're thinking it all about, I've been, it's been on my spirit, not just in the midst of COVID, but really sort of, it's, it's I guess it's been um, amplified in this moment. That there seems to be a disconnect between the way the public views the function of restaurants and sort of food space and the way we do. And the, the amazing thing about this moment has been having folks who, really didn't understand how the food system was really working um, to get, the, you know, this, this sort of the sense that restaurants were this public trust has sort of gotten demystified and the, the aspects of the realities of running a food-based business have gotten a little bit more transparent for the, for the guests. And I'm wondering if you think at all about or if you, if part of your practice is thinking about how to translate that to the guests. Like not so much to sort of... <clears throat> I mean, I mean, certainly part of it is sort of making sure that you talk about amplified customer service and those elements of, of you know, sort of guest expectation. But um, how are you thinking about translating this moment like that, that sort of raises age precarity um, to the guests, right? Because I think something about opening back and all the challenges of, of this moment have made it so that you kind of the folks who are staying and 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 remaining open and you know carrying on in this moment. Um, there's a really important, I think, connection between being a little bit more open about the challenging parts, but still making it a narrative that isn't that still has some joy to it. I guess. So I'm wondering if you're thinking at all about that translation because. People didn't really understand what this work was really about until this moment. Now, I'm, I'm sure they really still do, but it's, it feels like it's more room to have that kind of conversation. So that's a two-part answer. Mm -hmm. Because when I was transitioning out of the kitchen and I was doing reservations, I realized that people don't know what actually goes on in a restaurant right mm -hmm. so what really got me thinking which also shifted my blog as well what really got me thinking about things in a broader scope was i was on the phone with like i've been a reservationist now for a little over like five or six years in that time i realized just talking to customers every day realized that people don't know what first come first serve right people don't know the difference between a brunch and a lunch menu right people don't know why it's so important to cancel your reservation so i took that and was like shooting it out on twitter and i was like hey y'all <laughs> it's me <laughs> here's a thread of why we need you restaurants to cancel your reservation and I was just picking that up from people and just shooting it out on Twitter. Like, people don't know what a prefix menu is. All they know is they hate them. But I'm <laughs> like, okay, we know you guys hate prefix menus, but prefix menus serve other purposes than to feed you. So I started shooting that out on Twitter. I started shooting out why rest why you can't get into a restaurant when it's raining versus why mm -hmm. the restaurant is wide open when it's 100 degrees outside why you can't call me <laughs> on a 
Thursday for a 20 person brunch on Saturday, <laughs> you know, like, so I yeah. started shooting those things out on Twitter and people were like, I had no idea that if I don't cancel my reservation, it affects your food costs when people don't show up. And then food costs um, affects, and then food costs affects if a restaurant can stay open. So your yeah. favorite restaurant closed because for three years people didn't call and cancel their reservations properly, and the restaurant prepared all this stuff and the staff, and now they don't have the money. Like so, I just started doing that. Yeah. yeah. So the <clears throat> second part of that question is, I think COVID is showing people how incredibly hard this industry is how under-resourced we actually are mm -hmm. even the biggest restaurant groups are scrambling trying to figure out how they're going to open yeah even the biggest chefs are scrambling like i might not be able to open back up again and mm -hmm. i might not be able to start again so I think this, like, I think COVID has really broken and opened it up so people are a little bit more aware of why this restaurant is working the way they are, why it's important for staff to get tipped or not tipped or minimum wage or higher than minimum wage, why this plate of food costs what it does, yeah. why we need you to come in and eat with us and tell your friends. So I think COVID is will benefit us in the long run. Yeah. Yeah, people have no idea what we get up and do every day for 16 hours. So yeah, I was yeah. like, let me show you guys why you need a prefix menu on this 17 top <laughs> and five of your friends not gonna show up and I'm gonna charge you for those five friends. <laughs> you know? That part, exactly. Yeah. Um, we've been with Christopher Stewart, um, CEO of Me's Group and the Pride Trust of Eating Fabulously. I want y'all, if y'all have any questions, please be, um, want to be respectful of Christopher's time. We're going to uh, wrap up soon. But if you have any questions, drop them in the comments or in the, the question bar. Um, I would love to know if we could spend the last little bit of time maybe talking about, not laments and food media, but I guess like, talking a little bit about the power of the media space to tell story, right? Like mm -hmm. the um, the power to sort of craft narrative in a way that gives a brand's message out and sort of to tell stories in terms of the food space in ways that we discount a lot. And I think that's something you've really been able to do beautifully for, I mean, how, how old is um, Even Fabulously now? Uh, 11? Twelve. <laughs> I feel like we started around the same time, right? Like, um, just this uh, this ability to use media spaces, um, as as sort of a superpower. So I don't know. Just talk a little bit about your what you've seen change and just how you're thinking about this sort of new moment where we all in the midst of this reckoning or whatever. But um, just what you see, what you how you want to go forward. And, I mean, I pay a lot of attention to how food media, and I've had firsthand experience on how food media can get asses and seats, you know? Like mm -hmm. I like to say, um, you know, when I was at the Cecil, I really saw the power of food media and covering mm -hmm. PR and how those things can really help get the word out. And yeah. like, I don't have a marketing background, I don't have a PR background, but just knowing that that five person response, right? You love something you tell five of your friends, right? And the five of your friends tell. I think that became a little lost pre-COVID uh, pre mm. so much. I think restaurants Definitely. lost that because restaurants were like, well, my dining room is full, so I don't really need to do all I can for the five by five rule, right? And like, we need 
the PR and the marketing just as much as white restaurants do. Like we need it even more because mm. <laughs> what eyes do we have on us besides a couple? You know, like I have a friend who's constantly like praise me, but also endorse me, you know, like, yeah. Like, we need to beat these algorithms. We need to have eyes on us. And that's just, again, pure marketing. That's giving us enough time to get ourselves ready. Like, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. But also give me some time to, like, put my best foot forward. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's marketing. That's PR. That's not wanting me to, like turn my life or turn my restaurant into something in 24 hours because you didn't do it properly. Mm. But if you get time and you market me properly, I could stay open for two more years. I could stay open for yeah. five more years. Or I could get the call from Eater, you know, placement because you endorsed me in public and in private. So I think yeah. It's, I always wonder and it always angers me like why are we not getting these why don't we have these things and I think it's just access as much as people Definitely. have eyes on us we also don't have access to anything either so you know mm -hmm. like, my, my job prior to COVID I was the only black person and the only black woman in my office in a restaurant group in New York City and I'm like, there's nobody, nobody else is going to come in here but me, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and like every day I'm waiting for a new black person to come in and it's only me. And I'm like, there's so many bl dope black chefs and all these things that I know, but we need the access. We need the eyes. We need yeah. the marketing. We need the PR. We need all these things. Yeah. I, I, Absolutely. And I'm working on that as well with the Mies group in the next couple of years I do want to have like a influencer type either program or something for just influencers and to put eyes on people I don't know how I'm going to shape it yet but yeah it's it has to get the eyes on people I mean I feel like that's that's a really interesting um point you're making because <clears throat> there has been this kind of um I don't know, the world of sort of social media influence and sort of the use of social media as a tool has kind of gotten to be this like dirty word, like kind of mm -hmm. used in this trite kind of way that, that sort of diminishes some of its power. But if you're talking about the honest strategic value, um, trying to frame it in a way that is a useful tool um, that you like, we all aware of is a big thing. I mean, I, there's something really interesting about the way people consume um, eating fabulously, right? Like, there's a, a social contract there. Like, we we know you, we get to know your personality, we get to see your taste level, <clears throat> and so when you recommend a restaurant, we trust it, right? And when you are talking about this meal that you had that was so dope, we know that you have not only a background that's gonna let you to sort of evaluate the real culinary. Um, aspects of what you, you're talking about, but also, like, the deference to, like, yeah, your picks are dope, and, like, we want, like, you you create this sort of vocabulary that we want to be part of the choices that you make in it, the, the, the aesthetic world you create. And I guess that's, that's the power in, like, having clarity in the voice you have in the marketplace, right? Like, you know, influence is relative, but, like, being a voice in the marketplace that sort of determines like gets people to trust yeah. your voice is the biggest like that that social contract is really the biggest part you hit it right on the head it's clarity um and like i have clarity on what and it took me a while to figure out the ebbs and flows of what i personally want to do so that's why when i say hey go eat at this food cart on the corner people are going to go there because they, I've built that trust with you and I've influenced you to go there. But the clarity I feel is a big part of influence, especially mm. now. Social media has literally changed the way we eat. 
these fads and all that stuff, like, I can honestly say you've never seen a fad on my influence except the whip coffee. But I'm a coffee mm -hmm. drinker, so that fits who right. you, that fits me. But the clarity in yourself is knowing that if you're not a fad a fad person and if you don't eat like that in your everyday life, why are you posting it on, on Instagram? Like, you know, and that it's a it, that's a double edged sword because fad your numbers they get you, you you know calls they get you promotions all that stuff. It's the clarity that's gonna yeah you might not get and and I struggle with this myself too like. Why isn't anybody looking at me? But each time I had the clarity on something and I turned something down, something else bigger came. Instead, mm, of, that's chasing, a word. instead of something me chasing the fad and I got three likes on it. And I'm in myself, I'm like, I knew I shouldn't have posted that. Like that's what I get for looking over <laughs> at stuff. But it's natural to look over at someone else's stuff. But it's the mm -hmm. clarity that it's the clarity yeah. and knowing that, yes, this is social media. Yes, we're looking at a lot of things. Yes, social media has taught us how to eat differently. But you have to have clarity in your brand to have a blog for 12 years. You know, like, have all these yeah. things happen. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you use it. Also, I mean, I think it, it sort of goes back to all of it, right? It's whether you're a chef, whether you're a writer, whether you're a blogger, whatever. Like, you you are providing the, the your, your point of view to the marketplace, and people have to trust it, right? Like, if I don't if I don't believe you, if I don't want the, the liking what you do or sort of consuming what you do is given, right? Like, you hope that the, what you add into the marketplace is valuable, but like, if we don't trust you and we don't have consistency in what you say and do and how you show up in the marketplace, then it's all for not. So but I don't know. I, I, like never, I think it's so I am, dope. I'm never going to have y'all not out here eating fabulously. Okay. Like, like <laughs> if I don't eat it, I'm not going to tell you to go eat it. Like If I don't yep. go shop there or if I don't, make reservations there i'm not going to tell you guys to do it you know and that's where you have to decide in yourself as like a chef or an influencer or whatever in that creative space if i'm not doing this myself why would someone believe that i'm all like no clarity you are exactly yep oh, so good <laughs> all righty i i don't want to be respectful of your time and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us thank you. you are so dope and just you, your whole vibe i just i, I swear to god we are talking about full circle it's kind of like i remember meeting you really at the very beginning of all of this and just seeing how brilliant and consistent and just how stunning all of the work you do is and just how thank i don't you. know it's just it's inspiring for me as well like if sometimes i, I watch your feed or just see you move into the world and it just feels so good to know that you are precisely who we thought, thought about when we were talking about what it would look like if you just were free. What would, I, For me, it was, especially at the point in my career when I met you, it was like, what would it look like if someone who was young and fly benefited from the moment where we just had possibility? Just no change, no, just everything is just possible and your work is just i don't all possibility it's so fly to watch thank you like no this is a really a full circle moment guys i met therese when i was like wet behind the ears just like out of culinary school her and her team of amazing black women gave me a chance in their company at the time and like, I watch you as well. I'm like, damn, Teresa's on this panel. Like, she's doing this, she's doing that. So it's like a full circle moment. And I would not have wanted to talk to any other person besides you. So I'm glad that oh. we got to do this together. Same. Like, we watch each other. So Yeah. Same. So, yes, please go over, follow Christopher at the Mies Group. Follow her at Eating Fabulously. Go over and sign up for both 
websites, newsletters. Um, if you are food creative, I mean, you really should be thinking about hiring a meets group. There's her spectrum of services. Is, like she just explained to us, is four prong. It is multiple ways and it's customizable. And if you are thinking about your next steps and sort of what your work is going to look like in the next five plus years, I mean, you really need a strategy and, and Christopher has all the tools to help you navigate that. So you should be thinking about using her. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Come follow me. Even if it's just on Twitter when I'm talking about how I ate something from a trailer in the Bronx, which was actually true. <laughs> but yeah, follow me, me's group, eating fabulously everywhere. I'm everywhere. So. Yes. All right, lady. Talk to you soon. Thank, Thank you so much for this. No problem. Oh, that was so good. Her face. Christopher and her red lip give me life all the time. But yes, please make sure you go follow. Um, keep current with all of the cool things she has going on. Her Instagram, her Twitter, um, all her socials are amazing to follow and watch. And you might use her in, in the coming year or so. So, um, yeah, check her out. Talk to y'all next week.